No, we should stick on pop culture um, for one other item. And I think it's the most famous pretendian ethnic fraud case of 2023. And we talked about this on our live episode um, where we were celebrating our four year anniversary as a podcast on December 4th. And then Elaine and I mentioned this a bit in our last podcast, but the Buffy St. Marie case. Um, so that dropped on October 27th. I have only uh, scanned the very lengthy CBC expose um, on Buffy St. Marie. Uh, it seems fairly definitive to me that um, she lied about her indigeneity um, and is just a white woman who dyes her hair black and tans excessively. So, and it's a big and one love- because she is really a veteran celebrity uh, yeah. in the movement as well as in film and television and art music world and so she like she like has held power in all of the spheres of like public life and has really from what i can tell probably like taken up a lot of resources in all of those different spaces over the years and you know it's like a 50 plus year life or something and she like rubs elbows with really famous prestigious white people um for the most part politicians so activists um uh, you know, actors and celebrities and such. And so it's a really, it's a really big deal. It's an agree. It's probably, it's probably the most like egregious, <laughs> I think violation I've seen so far of any pretend. Is that true? I think it is given, given the amount. It's worse than like Andrea Smith and yeah. Given the amount of um, money that she herself made billing herself as a native artist, singer, songwriter, everything else, and the prestige that came along with it. And I think she's robbed so many native artists um, of their opportunities, of their chances. And I love what Comrade Nick said in that um, year in review that, that, uh, Johnny Depp's character in Pirates of the Caribbean um, got his look from Buffy St. Marie. That to me was probably the best description of what she looked like. And it's, it's, this is particularly like personal for me. Like I'm kind of all butthurt about it because I grew up with, uh, with her music and, you know, my, my dad was, um, a professor in the late sixties, early seventies. And we always had Buffy St. Marie albums, you know, in our house. And she was a friend of my dad's and, um, the very first convocation of American Indian scholars that he put together, um, at Princeton in 1970, 1970, um, that really a lot of people hold up as the, um, the precursor to creating American Indian studies, um, and the people who were there and Scott Mamaday, um, B medicine and, um, Russell means, and, you know, just like that group recognized that artists and elders were, and medicine men were necessary components when discussing how to teach American Indian studies. And Buffy freaking St. Marie was there. And like, to me, that's now one of those photographs in my mind that you wanna take and use a red pen and just cross her out. And I think for a lot of people, that's true that she, she represented something that, you know, she was part of that late 60s, early 70s push from the American Indian movement, but also from scholars and academics and writers. And Scott Mamaday was also there. He had just won the Pulitzer Prize for Housemaid of Dawn. I mean, there were all of these people that are going to go down in, in our history as this was the first native writer to win a Pulitzer Prize. And, um, you know, these were people who were important in early academia 
um, around um, native studies and everything having to do with with uh, native academia. And then there's Buffy St. Marie and you're just like, damn, um, how do yeah. you erase that? Yeah, no, it's like, now that you bring this up, I really appreciate it because I hadn't really made, I mean, it's an obvious connection, but I hadn't made it in my mind that she, like you're talking about this photograph of all of these OGs. Like these are people after World War II and during, in the precursor to Red Power, like the, you know, the people who founded the organizations that created the modern self-determination movement in Turtle Island, um, that created kind of department that I work in now, American Indian Studies and the one at UNM that I worked in, the generation that your father belonged to, um, that that was like the Avengers of indigenous political power of the 20th century. That was absolutely the cadre um, of incredible many now ancestors who made a lot of things possible for a lot of us today. And the fact that there's this like white interloper, this parasite, all pretendians are parasites, first of all. I don't know how you how you act as a how can you like ethically act as a parasite in like a community of people who've lost so much because of genocide and colonialism. That's incredibly perverse. I've said this before. Pretendianism is incredibly perverse, and it's actually one of the most pernicious forms of like settler fuckery that exists. It really is. Um, because I don't know, and if you do it for so long too, you just cozy up to these native people who are facing fucking termination and relatives are still in boarding schools at this time in history. And native people are really, really, if you look at the history, like one of the lowest points, the middle of the 20th century was a low fucking point for native nations. Like shit was real bad. People on the res were dying of tuberculosis everywhere. Like genocide was going real hard at native people in the 1950s and the 1960s. That is why red power was born. The circumstances were so bad that our people had no choice but to rise up and take action. And so to like, I don't know, to be a part of that cohort of actual brilliant revolutionaries and then to claim to belong to that for so long and then to lie about it, like, damn, like, damn. Buffy, you're going to hell too. <laughs> you are going to hell. That's, we need to start a new series. People who I don't are know, going I don't, to hell. I don't know so. if I believe in hell. Like, that's not really part of my religion. But the part of thing is <laughs> But it's like, yeah, that's like, uh, that's real. That's, that's Buffy, bad. you're going to hell. And, oh, and then to, to co-opt the trauma by claiming to be a victim of the 60s scoop. Oh and, no! That, I'm sorry, yeah, the, the, yeah. What was this? Was it the '60s? The '60s scoop. scoop. So in Canada, like, remember. there's also shit was real bad because of yeah. residential schools, and the and the children, because that that also kind of reminded me of the the podcast stolen because so many of the people that she interviewed um, had been. Um, victims of the of the '60s scoop, and you know they families were were decimated, and yeah. and children were ripped away from from their parents, and the the trauma that that carries, you know that that children grew up, Native Canadians grew up, um, not knowing where they were from or who their families were. And to claim that is not only like perverse, but it's just disgusting. And I, I just don't know how she could have done it. And I don't know how she continues to do it with continued denials, continued denials. And, you know, I think, yeah, she's going to hell, but also all of those folks that believed in her and that just welcomed her because pretendianism, you know, was not such a major thing in the late sixties, early seventies. I mean, I think our OG um, ancestors didn't think that anyone would want to pretend to be native because exactly. most those, that's what I'm yeah, saying. Most, most of those folks, you know, were coming from 
I mean, and we've had this conversation before, but like my father was dragged away to, to boarding school. My, my father was almost taken away and adopted out um, of his, of his community um, because of circumstances surrounding his birth. And like, those are real, that's my real family history. And when I think of my father, I can't, he couldn't even have imagined why someone would want to claim that. It was so painful. So they didn't think about that back then. They were concerned with doing whatever they could to, to give back to the communities, to, to help the communities rise, to help our people, to create a path forward for our people. And that was, the, like you said, the start of Red Power. And just to see her now in her, her 80s having benefited from all that work and benefited from jumping on that train and and riding it for all it was worth until now it just yeah it's pretty disgusting i don't know what else to say yeah but what do you what do you say about that i don't other than like that's awful and and i always say this another one bites the dust there's just like a like a graveyard of pretendians it, it's, it's weird it's like it's I, you know, and obviously, like, people have very strong feelings about the way in which the outing, the truth telling um, about pretendians has unfolded over the last handful of years. Um, we've been attacked uh, multiple times for taking strong stances about ethnic fraud on the podcast and as the Red Nation. Um, but it's not a, you know, I've made this analysis before, and you're just talking about like the trauma and like, how pretendians capitalize on trauma, um, the trauma of of surviving and sometimes barely surviving genocide that goes intergenerally, it, that is intergenerational in native families. Um, so I have a very strong critique of trauma and the way that pain is utilized and weaponized politically um, in ways that are really troubling to me. But pretendianism is certainly one phenomenon, um, a very a very prevalent one. Um, in which indigenous trauma is benign um, for social and political capital. Uh, in, you know, I'm, I'm assuming at the time, the 50s and the 60s, when Red Power is being born, um, this is the advent of kind of neoliberalism and trauma, you know, starts to inform the public sphere and politics in a way that is utterly unique to that period to live under it. But it's very interesting because Buffy St. Marie almost like predates what I would see as kind of like the pinnacle of neoliberal trauma politics. And so she's like the OG pretendian. <laughs> um, and you know, there were other like AIM activists like Ward Churchill um, and Jimmy Durham um, who have also been pretty uh, closely, you know, revealed as being ethnic frauds, um, just being white dudes um, who had very, a great deal of influence um, in the American Indian movement and radical politics in the 20th century. But I think Buffy St. Marie, because she crosses all of the different realms, the activist, um, the political realm, the art, the film industry. Uh, yeah, and then claimed, attached her claims, tried to verify her indigeneity through like her experience in the 60s scoop, um, which is like a trauma, quote unquote, based experience. That's like, I don't know, her story should be like studied as like a very interesting um, arc within the way that neoliberal trauma politics has really taken hold in indigenous politics um, in Turtle Island. And so to me, it's like, that's why it's extremely significant. Yeah. Or is yeah. extremely significant for that reason, because of what it tells us yeah. about that history and that trajectory.